Hello, hello, hello. Welcome back to the Feel Good Factor. I'm Susmita Viganasaurus and I'm so glad you could join me here today. Hi everyone. I'm so excited to have one of my favorite authors here on the show today. Her name is Ria Rodriguez Mukherjee. And I'm sure if you've been listening to my podcast all along, you'll remember from an earlier episode where we had Ria and Sam and the three of us discussed a lot about uh, collaboration and people supporting each other and moving forward and everything. For quite some time now, I wanted to have Ria here to talk to her about her book. Ria is an author and she's one of the founders. She's a co-founder of Write Leela Write, which is a design and content uh, laboratory. and Ria's book, The Body Myth, was published last year. It's actually been exactly one year since I finished reading the book. I was going through my Instagram uh, stories, the history, and uh, that's what popped up like last year. I think around July 24th or 25th is when I had posted the review about the book and told everyone how much I loved it. (laughs) I got Ria here because I thought we can talk about her book, of course, and about love in general. Love, relationships, these are things that we've all grown up with certain conditionings, certain ways that we think of it. But Ria's book and Ria's way of thinking has been different and it has brought the whole concept in a in a new light. And um, it's a beautiful story. And of course, the writing style itself and her words, her imagery, everything is so poetic and so lovely, yet simple. It's not poetic in terms of just some floral language, but it's actually so beautiful, easy to understand down to earth. So I wanted to talk to Ria about love and yeah, let's see what else comes up along the way. Hi, Ria. Hi, Shreya. Thank you so much for having me and thank you for such like beautiful words about me. My ego is just completely flying. Fangirl speaking here. (laughs) Ria, can you tell me a little bit about um, generally like when did you start writing? How did you become an author and just the journey into writing itself? Yeah, I I think I had the little knack of writing when I was 15, 16, but I didn't think much of it because I was really bad in the school system. I was like a complete failure in that. So I never kind of connected the dots that, you know, if you're going to be a writer, somehow it translated that, you know, you have to have some other kind of sense of grounding in academics or, you know, understanding of it was just like, I just never thought of myself as a person that could actually crack something like that. But I always my interests were always veered towards creative expression, theater, writing, things like that. But uh, I really never wrote my first short story till I was 22. Um, like my first serious short story. And it kind of went from there. And then so this is long kind of story about how I got there. I'm I'm 36 years old right now, right? So it's, it was a really long journey, because I actually studied social work and my bachelor's degree because I was in the US at the time my family had moved back to the US when I was 18. And I was really interested in psychology, I thought that I was going to become a forensic psychologist, uh, or a social worker. And so th- those were the kind of places that I was really, really interested in being. And I did. I, I studied. My, my degree was in social work. I worked in the mental health space for a, a long while in the U.S. before I decided that, you know what, being in the system itself, a lot of issues were starting to show up to me that like systematic issues that I thought, well, I don't know if I'm really making a difference here. I think I'm a cog in the wheel. And I think it was at that time I really realized that I had a not a skill, but a, a need to express. You know, that's when I took that chance and I started writing more and you know putting stuff out there and then I had the opportunity to do my master's in fine arts in creative writing and that really gave me you know two years to just read and talk about writing and write a lot and say okay yeah this is this is what I can do and this is what I really want to do and then there was just a pile and pile of rejections and failed novels and short stories that never got published but slowly and surely I mean, like most writers are going to tell you, a lot of artists are going to tell you, if you keep going, then you, you you find your path. And, you know, I can talk a little bit more about that. But yeah. Yeah. So this is, you know, what you said about the school system and the writing. Mm-hmm. I so agree with you. I mean, or rather, I would say I resonate with that because I was not uh, the best of uh, students in the school system. It was simply because I wasn't interested in studying and all the subjects didn't interest me. Only certain ones did and the others didn't. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, so i wasn't uh, say a popular among the teachers or anything <laughs> academically you were just getting by i was getting by i was a very average student and i would always study like you know in the last minute before the exam and then just manage pass or 60 whatever just right. get through and then the subjects that i i loved one of which was english i would do well because you know i actually enjoyed it i i loved uh, writing the essays in the yeah. english language exam i loved studying the books and then the poems especially and then interpreting them you know with all the answers and everything in the english text exam and so this really interested me but like i said because i was such an average student i never imagined that oh i would be writing one day or i'd be good at it mm-hmm. <laughs> though i always had an inclination towards it so it really makes me think of um, you know i think things are changing now but the standard school system makes many people doubt themselves they have such a cookie cutter way of judging the capacity and the talent of the students and it's so good that despite going through that you still realize that oh i have this inclination this passion to write and then just attempted it and then kept at it even despite the rejections which as you said are common among authors and everything because i i mean i can't even imagine like so much of talent would have been just lost if you gave up <laughs> because of the school system just yeah. just making you feel like i'm not capable of this <laughs> i do know that you at a very 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 young age at 22 you went through a very bad marriage and a divorce and everything yeah. right and and you had written this incredibly powerful article the way you had expressed that whole story that everything that you've gone through the emotions that you felt and coming through it completely so is that something that triggered you to write you know in a more more uh, stronger way Hey, actually, you know that if you ask me, that was actually a byproduct of not even knowing yourself. I think the schooling system and this binary cookie cutter thing that you said it left a lot more scars than the than I ever you know accounted for uh, things that I could only see much later in life. Because getting married that young, completely first of all out of choice, which is a disastrous, disastrous choice to someone who was very abusive also. But anyway, the point over here is is because I didn't really know myself. and you said that it doesn't allow people to it, 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 it makes people doubt themselves i would say it goes so much as to not even allow you to see those elements in yourself unless you really really like stay with those gut feelings because it can crush spirits you know yeah in in its worst avatar it can crush spirits because it's a very binary way of saying this is how first of all it's a setup to say this is how you have to be successful in life mm-hmm. there were a lot of other subtle keys right when when i was studying in the 90s i know things have changed now but still it hasn't right in a lot of ways in a lot of mainstream ways it i don't think it really has changed no because uh, now the competition and the the pressure in the standard academic place like not in the alternative schools but more like the standard regular schools the old old system schools what i'm saying you know 50 60 average and all that is nothing that is like a scary thought to them right now even students who get even 75 80 are considered you know average or lower yeah, that's terrifying that's scary i can't even go there that's terrifying <laughs> and there's a lot of other subtle hints right in the schooling system is that first of all um, you know a lot of teachers and all that i mean they would even bluntly say things like yeah after this you're going to get married or you know even in after 10th standard so there are a lot of subtle hints about what makes you successful if you don't study this then how will you get into science stream so i mean all these markers of success what you're supposed to be how you're supposed to be groomed you know all of these inferences of what makes you successful i think gets coded into a lot of our subconscious and so when i had this thing with my first marriage it was actually me just trying to find some identity because also i was brought up in between two countries so i was born in the us but then i did fifth standard to a 12th standard in in bangalore and then again i was thrown back to the us so i not only had culture shock i had reverse culture shock also and i think when i was 19 i got super super depressed because one yeah i was enjoying the flexibility of american college life i had the privilege of that right but at the same time i was i hadn't figured out really who i was because of all the scarring and trauma of i would say 5th to 10th standard because in 11th and 12th i actually did my puc in bangalore and i got into arts and i did theater and i was really enjoying myself for the first time in india so much so that i was really quite battered about the fact that you know my family moved back to the us so i think i was you know really trying to find my identity during those years and 
you know, to be honest with you, I don't think I really found a true sense of who I was and became as confident in being able to even talk about these things um, with such vulnerability until I was in my 30s. Mm. And now it's a very empowering fact because now I've completely been able to realize that, yeah, whatever I was, I, I've come to this space where I can like completely in the moment spontaneously keep expressing myself. And that is such a liberating joy. It, it, it's something that could have been taken away or crushed out. And I feel like so many people can suffer from this crushing out of it. And I hope anybody listening knows that it, it is possible to completely subvert that if you just, you know, open up our worldview of, about what we've been taught, about what makes us you know, what makes us qualified to be in in the world? What makes us qualified to just follow our dreams and exactly. uh, do whatever we want to do? Exactly. <laughs> you know, you were talking about that science stream thing. That is another ridiculous thing because it's like they categorize it in such a way. It's like uh, what uh, first uh, category, second and third. As if to say that science is superior than commerce exactly. is medium and arts is <laughs> lower grade. And they would even give admission based on your overall marks, yeah. which who came up with that ridiculous nonsense? No sense whatsoever. After my 10th, I did my 11th and 12th and I continued doing ISC in my own school, which I, I dreamt of. I didn't want to go to PUC. I wanted to continue in my school and all those things. But it was difficult for me to get admission. I wanted to do commerce. And despite the fact that my maths marks were very high in the previous mm -hmm. the 10th uh, boards, mm -hmm. Just because my marks were poor in some random stuff like biology and history and stuff like that. That's what was uh, pulling my marks down, my overall percentage down. And history and geography were down actually. <laughs> and yet they were like, go to arts because your overall marks are lower. <laughs> it's crazy, yeah. It's like, come on. I wish I had that sense back then to be able to point out and say that, Hey, look, but these are the subjects I'm good at and therefore I'll be good at accounts and all these things. Right. I really wish so many times I've replayed that in my mind. <laughs> Ria, you're talking about this whole thing of uh, being brought up to believe certain mm. things, right? Whether it is the school system or whether it's the society in general, yeah. there are so many conditionings and restrictions placed upon us. Right. I see now the younger kids, uh, the millennials now who are in, in their early 20s and whatnot, who are able to finally freely express about being gay, you know, being bi, being, uh, what do you say, any, anything but heteronormative exactly. versus gender, exactly. you know, yeah. Uh, yeah. being all of that, they are actually able to express it and talk about it and things are changing. I do see that. At least in the bigger cities, to some extent, yeah. things are changing. And love is being seen as love. And that's it. Yeah. And nothing more. But still, there is a very, very long way to go for it to become much more normalized. Now, in your book, you go a further step into the zone of polyamory. Mm -hmm. Polyamory is something, it was a concept that I had heard of. I got to know about maybe five, six years ago. I didn't even know about it. And the first time I heard about it, I was like, what? Mm -hmm. That was such a shocking thing to me. But the more I read about it, and of course, you know, the universe has its way of sending things. Right. So just around the time when I was discovering more about it, reading up and understanding more about it, was the time when I even had a couple of polyamorous uh, people coming to carrots and you know, I overheard them talking about it. And then I jumped into their conversation. Oh, wow. I'm like, yeah. oh my God, tell me more about this. And you know, these two women were talking about it and everything. Of course, later I found out they were on a date and I <laughs> crashed and the date. Crashed the date. With your curiosity. <laughs> That's beautiful. I just thought it was just two women discussing the topic. It didn't occur to me. But then, you know, <laughs> but they were lovely and they shared so much about their own experiences and wow. everything. And that blew my mind that, Oh my God, you know, there are so many ways to love people. Yeah. There are so many ways to just spread this positive energy. And there is so much of restriction surrounding oh it, you gosh. know. Yeah. Tell me how you got the idea for your book. I know that the other thing is mental health and all right, that. Right. Yeah. But the polyamory angle, you know, how did you get the idea for that? So, I mean, I think there are two contexts here. One is in the context of the book. But then there's also the context of this larger conversation of what polyamory really means. And even though, like, I feel maybe my book doesn't even do service to my actual thoughts of it, because it does take the more, you know, sexual and more, the eyes, eyebrows raised, like, whoa, 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 how are they doing that? Married couple and this, 
but in in the book you know it was really a response to grief because i feel like it's in the middle of grief that a lot of whatever our considered normalcy is it's completely ripped off from under our feet and in that space i feel humans can suddenly react within that spectrum from a space that is not so aligned with how they've been conditioned to act and there's this brief spell and some people you know you know obviously some people can become massively depressed or some people can just take wild life choices or they can become self destructive but also i think there's a spiritual answer in this which is there's this fleeting moment where you can probably just express yourself without any other thoughts and rules and that's really what in the book it was just these three characters coming together in a really odd way each needing something from the other person intellectually emotionally and it, it you know that was the inevitable answer to the plot of the book even a few years ago i think i was very like it just stood out as something quite out there you think about poly i mean some people just think about people who are just having uh, like 10 other relationships or having orgies or whatever i mean sure there are people who do lots of different things and more power to them but but i think polyamory at at its very essence deconstructs this notion that we get everything from one person and when you look at the construct of monoamory i'm not going to even say monogamy because that's in the context to marriage but monoamory even it comes into friendship right like my best friend mm. right and therefore there's these demands put on a best friend that they cater to their every emotional need they express with them when they when required they show up for them in all of these reasons and of course on a very basic structural way of course a partner or a spouse or a best friend has their role in all our lives but are we all going to say that we don't have relationships with other people that sparks different sides to us and i think it's just been quoted in oh yeah that's just a friend or that's a you know a person who is like my sister or we say these things like this person like my sister or this person like just knows my soul <laughs> I think it's because of uh, the lack of actual uh, labels to use. First of all, labeling it is is where we are limiting ourselves, yes. right? So too much so. Yeah. And I think hmm. when you look at polyamory is just deconstructing the notion that love is not something that is finite. It just because you love one person doesn't mean more love can't come from another part of you and that you can't like it's a more expansive idea of what love is and self is because your self is ever expanding. So there are always parts of you that can expand and love in different ways. and and i think if we can all kind of see that there's a lot for all of us to learn from it and i think all of us in some way actually are polyamorous but we just don't see it that way maybe because you know we we haven't sexually explored that but that's not the only definition of what polyamory can be it can be a very intense emotional a bond that you have with a person right and in a very like what would you in a monogamous way people would label that maybe emotional cheating but maybe these are just boundaries that we have struck up with ourselves to keep ourselves contained right because marriage by itself is a heteronormative idea and it obviously also has a very large bearing in how it's kept people to keep certain systems in place right because it's just easier that way it doesn't actually keep systems in place either because you see the serial monogamy you see yes. lot of people breaking up yes. you see lot of people cheating in their so called cheating again not a word i like to use because again the mind needs to change with exactly. the way they think of it but you know this judgment and this restriction that comes in it right why does cheating happen like why is cheating such a huge word right because we say cheating cheating this that tell me one long term marriage that has never had its own secrets or weird shit going on or periods of difficulty or whatever is just to say that you know because of these boundaries we've kept ourselves or this morality that we have decided that has to be the the gold star then it's just so much harder for us to express how we are and who we are So that's how I'm seeing it nowadays. Yeah, and uh, being aware of this, first of all, accepting, like you said, that there is always something for us to explore and think about it with our mind beyond this whole boundary, mm-hmm. and calling things for what they are, or or rather, not labeling them <laughs> uh, for things which they aren't. Uh, so, f- say, like you said, you know, emotional cheating and <laughs> right. emotional affair, and uh, you know, this that. maybe it's just being open to the fact that there is nothing inherently bad in any of this will help everybody of course you know someone doesn't have to be polyamorous to support the concept or be an ally right okay. it's just like any other absolute thing so i think just people acknowledging and being very honest about uh, their authentic feelings what they go through at all times 
that i think will really help people become more non judgmental and also less fearful of expressing these ideas of uh, even support towards something that that is so against the societal uh, norms absolutely yeah because we're all growing people like either a lot of people who do just don't get the chance or you know emotional bandwidth to keep growing but in general human beings are thriving when they are personally growing so that means if you're growing you're expanding in different ways there's no way that you can be stagnant and we also have a tendency to mark success with the number of years you're with a person or the number of you know these kind of milestones somehow equate us with being happy and that's not necessarily true it can be but it's not necessarily true and this is the dominant narrative yeah absolutely i mean you can actually be with someone for just one week or one month you change your life. and be incredibly happy yeah. and just because things didn't work out and the relationship ended it doesn't mean it was a flop you know it, there was no success in it yes for all we know that one week or that short lived one month relationship was the best happiest uh, most free time that you've had <laughs> in your yeah. whole life compared to all the long term relationships that you've had including not just romantic relationships but you know families friendships and everything i so agree yeah it's like in india we're obsessed with the with the idea of love fail no like love failure ho gaya because uska <laughs> matlab kya hai we all have you know all our movies and books and all are kind of based on these love fails and they're not failures they're moments of that taught you something and then what is a love success then you know again it goes into a very heteronormative narrative that you married the person and stayed with them till you died and is only is that called the success even if there were so many other issues within it so nobody questions these things right so if we just open up our heads and hearts to this i think there's a potential for us to grow our imagination of what human engagement even means oh there's a world of potential out yeah. there <laughs> yeah true true uh, what was the general reaction to the book and to this whole idea the concept that you came out uh, with in the book and i i do know that the book doesn't the story doesn't just start with polyamory it mm-hmm. it starts off at so called cheating and then leads into an understanding and then you know more harmony being found right it develops into polyamory later right so what was in general whether in india or whether with the western audience what's been the reaction to the story of the body myth well with in the us i think it was uh, quite appreciated in terms of what it was trying to explore within the mental health arena because there's a lot of questioning in the book at least uh, you know from an author's point of view also of how this labeling also does does us a disservice or the pathologizing of uh, mental illness is not the only answer because you know when i was writing the book it was also a spiritual response from myself to the world it was an existential question and i don't think a lot of people actually at least the people who reviewed the book i don't think that was caught on much even though that was for me the center of my writing the book uh, was a very spiritual question it wasn't to do with the polyamorous or mental health part as much as it was to do that those are larger themes that kind of explored what i was feeling at the time which was just asking these very larger questions about what it meant to to kind of be without so much of this luggage and baggage of the stories that we created for ourselves funnily enough sushmita there was a few more people who were quite scandalized in terms of the polyamory point of view because i think that even though the us you would think is a lot more liberal in terms of their ideas about relationships <laughs> when it comes to marriage it's quite like there is a dominant narrative mm. you know and a lot of a narrative of cheating cheating it comes from a very colonized mindset also true true because you know in india we already had uh, you know, <laughs> we had polygamy as well as of course the standard version of polygamy has been one man with multiple women and what not yeah. but actually if you go back to the history of say kerala or uh, some of the yeah. tribes in the northeast and stuff it's like one woman with multiple exactly. men so that that existed too very much and that was the norm right but those got invisibilized because you know like we take the colonial mainstream narrative and so it's a very colonized idea to think about this kind of man woman marriage in this context as um you know the all powerful thing and so therefore this thing was looked at as cheating and so it was scandal like they were more scandalized there i felt from the general readers about that mm. then when it came out in india but then of course the dynamics of india are differently different because you're looking at english readership mm. in india which of course there's a huge number but it's not it doesn't represent the whole country and what they think 
Yeah, and the kind of uh, demographic who would pick up your book. <laughs> exactly, that's the difference. But in general, like I felt like for India, like the people who read it, like there was a lot of, I think at the very least, a lot of people thought it was a fresh way of looking at things. And and not to say that this, I mean, because in regional languages in India, I think we've been always very progressive. Yes. It's just English Indian writing that has always had to submit to a more pleasing the West as a as a narrative. And that's completely now come unhinged because now we're doing whatever we want. <laughs> but if you look at our regional uh, languages, like in Malayali and Bengali and all of these things, people have been writing really progressive and weird and gothic and eerie and, you know, really all stretchy expanding kinds of things that I didn't feel like were in English Indian writing until maybe 15 years ago. Yeah. In fiction, you know. Yeah. True, true, true. Absolutely. Even uh, to what I've heard, uh, though I haven't read much of it myself, uh, Mm -hmm. but my parents read a lot of Kannada books Mm -hmm. and Again, you know, you would hear about this, like not that it was specifically underlined for us that this is the topic, but always you knew that it was a little bit different and it was uh, much more progressive and the way of looking at things, you know, not the way we were taught in school with the English stories. (laughs) Yeah, it's so funny because even the stories that like even in our English classes and all that, yeah, I mean, now that I think about it, oh my God, it was so colonized. It was so pedantic. It was so like the Englishman kind of (laughs) understanding of what it is to be, you know, study or read in English. Even though there were so many other things written in English from different spaces in the West, but we also took the very stuffy Englishman kind of approach with that which is the narrative we still suffer from right now, right? Yeah, because, I mean, 200 years, they've drilled that into our head. Exactly. So it's going to take at least 100 <laughs> for it to get out, right? <laughs> exactly. And, you know, in fact, when uh, people are still, uh, you know, if ever they're homophobic or uh, if they question like this kind of uh, people having relationships mm-hmm. with multiple people, mm-hmm. regardless of marriage or not, you know, I always say that, uh, you know what, you're being, uh, <laughs> you're, you're, you're giving up Indian culture. You're talking yeah. against Indian culture. Really? Because uh, our culture is actually based on a much more free way of uh, looking at love. Much more nuanced, yeah. Have you read this, um, the book about the Travancore uh, princesses? Oh, yeah, like Manu Pillai. Manu Pillai's book, yeah. Ivory Throne, Ivory, Ivory Throne. Throne. Yeah. So, in that, there is so much of this explained, you know, whether the complete crushing of the Devadasi culture, which again right. was... Growing up, when you hear the word Devadasi, it was told to us in such a way that they were bad. Absolutely, yes. But the beauty, they were artists and the kind of uh, freedom and the status in society that they enjoyed. It's so sad to hear the way that was crushed. And then the whole matriarchal society, especially in the whole Kerala side and the way things were. Again, the freedom and the status and the power that women enjoyed. You know, it makes you realize that also inbuilt with this whole idea of uh, heteronormative and then, you know, man-woman monogamy, all these things, all that again was developed to crush women. So that is again work against feminism in general, right? Yeah, and also, I mean, look at what we've also done, right? We've also like, if you look at that dominant culture of Brahminism, that has just inherited the colonized idea. You're talking about Devdasis. They were artists and it was the colonial people that got uncomfortable with it. And therefore, it was redefined and made proper by Brahmin women taking this as an art. But but the erasure comes from uh, the actual Devdasi culture, right? Of the Mm. art form. So so we're Mm. just repeating these really claustrophobic and toxic cycles of what is proper and how we are supposed to be living, you know. Have you seen that in the more, like you said, that now with the books also things have changed. English, Indian literature, the way it's changed and becoming more progressive over time and stuff. So overall, do you see a change of culture and mindset of people in India, especially the urban crowd and stuff? You know, we can't even go back to the rural crowd because we are the ones who are more colonized. (laughs) You know, they're only a step away. It's actually a lot of this. They may call it something else and they may be ashamed and hide it. But still, the whole, uh, you know, having multiple partners and stuff, that's a lot more common in the rural. Absolutely. Absolutely. Like, see, also LGBTQ culture has also been urbanized. And, uh, uh, you know, what we hear about on the internet, we're talking mostly about a more privileged sect of people. Yes. Queerness and uh, sexuality and gender has been expressed in many different indigenous ways that we might not even be aware of or we don't see it, right? Because we're looking at it from 
the lens of urban uh, living, right? We just put things into categories here. Yeah. So like you said, like I think this country is so nuanced, you can't bring it up in a sentence. Anything you say, there'll be an exception and the exceptions can be as much as the, the stereotype. <laughs> yeah, know? yeah. So that's why, I mean, in the urban narrative, yeah. has it changed? People's mindset, is it changing, you know, in terms of people looking at love in a whole new way as something that's beautiful and, you know, as long as there's consent, then... There is nothing wrong in anything. That kind of a uh, mindset, do you see that? I think we are. See, I want to be optimistic. So yes, I think a lot of important discussions are happening on all of these fronts, right? In terms of just questioning everything that comes from a heteronormative understanding of the world, right? Because when you say heteronormative, it's also about it establishes a financial code, what your savings are supposed to look at. How you're supposed to have kids? How are you supposed to educate them? How are they supposed to fit into gender binary notions? A heteronormative is also like you have to respect these types of people and elder people and uh, these authorities because you just have to. So heteronormative also is a space of a lot of unquestioning. It's not just heteronormative and then there are people who are gay and lesbian. It's so much more expansive than that. Mm. And so I think a lot of people are having those conversations. But I'm not sure how we're confronting that in real life. While I think the internet is a great tool of democratizing voices and, uh, you know, at least allowing people to have those voices, a lot of them are still, you know, living in homes that can be very oppressive or where they can't even talk about these things. So I think we still have a long way to go to make huge cultural shifts. But I think we're in the middle of it, Shishmita, and I think there are a lot of, I'm, I mean, the things that we're discussing today are things that, my God, if I had heard even 10% of it when I was growing up, I would have, you know, probably not even suffered half the trauma I did. So <laughs> I think that's a lot, you know, mm, to take yeah, back. Definitely, definitely. See, when you're talking about heteronormative and then, you know, the LGBT culture, queer culture, all these things. Mm -hmm. But what about people's mindset in terms of uh, polyamory and because even within the queer culture, there is this whole thing of still yeah, monogamy and, you know, a lot of that, right? It's because we're human beings. So we take models that we also grow up with or have those foundations with. And we, we sometimes just replace them with the same toxic models that can, you know, may work or may not work. Listen, I think companionship is something that is fundamental to human nature, right? And people are doing it in different ways. Mm. But it's not like you can just say the larger queer community is on the same page, not at all, right? It's like, or like they're all severely different voices and opinions and understandings of it. But I think like if we can understand, no matter where we are coming from, that we're all kind of responding to a space that is from the same foundation, even if you're saying, you know, urban, the urban context of India, and you're even looking at a smaller, like middle class and above, you know, even if you're looking at that pool of people, because that's mostly the pool of people who are talking in English and on the internet anyway. So if we can kind of establish that we're responding to, you know, so many different conditioning and so many different predefined understandings of self, then I feel like we won't be attacking each other as much. Mm -hmm. Because I feel there's a lot of, there's a culture of attacking each other right now or just articulating something that sounds correct and might be correct, but really has nothing to do with how you are as a human being. And I think that is something that's really core to our being is like, who are you as a human being at the end of the day? You can articulate really well. You could have a great opinion. You can slice and dice, you know, somebody else's understanding of the world. But who are you as a human being? This is a fundamental learning for me. As you know, I've also been quite active on social media over the years. I mean, it's been an evolution for me too. Oh, yeah. It's so right what you said. I absolutely agree with you. I've seen a lot of your posts, especially in the recent times. And mm -hmm. one thing that, you know, you always carry in your posts is this whole thing of uh, non-judgment and not seeing things in black and white or even like gray or... Yeah. Being understanding of a person's point of view as a person and not as a specific kind of person or a person from a specific movement, but just as a person and how to give them space, how to be understanding of them and not attacking, like you said, you know, this whole thing of peace. Because ultimately, finally, that is the basis, right? That is what we need to go when we say love and peace. This is what we need to go towards, like not 
okay my my way of thinking is right and i am helping the world and then yours is wrong right. and i am doing this in a better way and that's what leads to all the subcultures like Absolutely. you said no matter what movement like i mean both of us are vegan and just within the vegan it's movement so we've seen like oh my god yeah 100 you see these amazing organizations doing fantastic work but yet the organization splits and there's something else and there's something why mm-hmm. because everybody thinks differently everybody is judging each other but I think culture of collaboration that again adds to creating more love in the world in general. I so agree with you about that, you know, the not attacking part. So, do you have a book with you right now by any chance? Yeah, I do. Can you read one of your favorite <laughs> before we close? Yes, for sure. uh, one Which of one? your favorite. One sec, let me just get it. I'll just read this. This section of the book called Kathan and I, a succinct version. Okay. It's in the beginning of the book and it's introducing you to the main character, Mira, her story. Because in the beginning of the book, she's a young widow. So before she even gets in, you know, really into the story about how she meets this married couple, Sarah and Rahil, she's telling the readers about her past life. I think this hits a lot of the notes that we were just talking about, Sus. Yeah, sure. I'll just read this section out. It's a self-contained small chapter. So. Sure, sure. Ketan and I, a succinct version. Let me confirm one thing now, because it's simply true. Love is only romantic when you've lost it. Or if you can't have it. In the end, I lost my love. Eventually, the pain and vulnerability and howling grief were drowned in the bitterness and the boredom that only insomnia can birth. But was Ketan a love before he died? Kierkegaard, the Danish philosopher, said romantic love and marriage could never be experienced in the same lifetime. This is why we humans perpetually suffer from angst, or rather a running between two conflicts, an oxymoron, two things that can never be at once. Heartbreak arises only when you've been stupid enough to expect anything as a given. A happy marriage that lasts 50 years, children who grow up and don't die before you, or a promotion that comes every few years. Heartbreak can only come from expectation. I had a naive, awkward, gentle expectation of Ketan. That he would be with me until I was old. That I would probably be the first to die. That he, if anyone, could bear the brunt of losing me. Mundane office love stories are the most predictable of all. They only exist because people like us forget how to express our desire to live and love beyond the walls of conference rooms and meetings where glances can be exchanged. Ketan and I were the sort of people who thought social bonding was employing a chai break to talk about a co-worker with smug judgments. Our moments of joy were heaped upon the everyday baseline of light traffic, three-day weekends, and the candied HR emails that urged us to keep leading and achieving our goals. He was a project manager. I was leading internal communications. I had forgotten the main purpose of the company we used to work for. There were far too many experts, far too many divisions for anyone to form a cohesive image of the entire company and its place in the world. I barely had an idea then, much less now. Still, I controlled its intranet, sent out firm-wide updates and helped the interns resize images. Because it's precisely being such a cog in the machine that allows you to fall in love in the first place. If you are trapped in mundanity, it's impossible not to latch your poor soul onto something or someone that makes you realize your vulnerable pumping heart will only beat a certain number of times, no matter how clean the air is inside those air-conditioned walls. I'll stop there. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) Just starting this off is making me want to go back and read the book again. (laughs) I think one year is a good enough break. Uh, Ria, do you have any more books? Are you working on anything? Any ideas, uh, even if not writing, for your next uh, novel? Yeah, I'm I'm actually working on a kind of outline for a non-fiction book that's actually talking about love as a form of resistance. Mm. It's going to be non-fiction though, so it's more of like some essays put together of stories about these small miracles you witness in people. So I don't know, it's a very initial stage. And then um, I have a weird idea for some strange fiction book. <laughs> I don't know how that's going to pan out. Again, it's probably going to be very dark because I am very. I get very dark with my fiction. But I wouldn't say that uh, this was very dark. I mean, it was dark. Yeah. But in the darkness, there's light. Yes. And that's yes. what I expect out yes. of your yeah. Yeah. writing. You know, it's not dark and like, 
oh everything's depressing and yeah. then blah, you know <laughs> no it's not like that yeah it's just not mm-hmm. i think my writing is just not scared to go there um but then mm-hmm. also try mm-hmm. to make sense of it because i am i think as a human being also a, a very optimistic person so yeah that shows so yeah you were you were saying it it's very dark and yeah it is it and then i feel like it's going to be again very intimate in terms of the amount of characters i think i don't know why but i some something about you know how i started writing the body myth i think that, that i found a, a larger voice to my writing which is a little bit almost claustrophobic in terms of the people involved in the book and you know the searching for it i haven't really fleshed it out yet but it's going to look at you know a character and i think like a, a long lost love how something devastating happened and not in the way you think mm. um and how that kind of forms her looking at her life that's gone by so that's what i'm trying to play with i don't know how that's going to come out but <laughs> well i'm waiting and i'm excited and i hope it pans out fast <laughs> even your your non fiction book the whole topic sounds really great and um, you know i i can't wait to read both of them Meanwhile, of course, uh, you're still writing uh, blog posts and things like that. I am. Yeah, mostly. I'm actually mostly writing on social media. <laughs> <laughs> no, go, go back to writing on your blog. Yeah, you know, I should, we lose. I, I know the temptation of doing this. Just type it on social media and be done with exactly. it. But yeah. there is so much that you lose, you know, over time. And definitely, please go back to putting it on Medium and wherever else, like you were, you were doing your writing. So just. <laughs> yeah. No, that's. That's good advice. I will. <laughs> cool. So, Ria, how can uh, people connect with you? How can they find you? And I'm very much out there on social media, very public. On um, Facebook, I'm Ria Rodriguez Mukherjee, and uh, of course on Instagram, I'm Messy Cooking, always uh, always vegan. So it's Messy Cooking uh, underscore always vegan. I'm also there on Twitter, but I don't really care much for Twitter. I think it's a, a really bit of a toxic hellhole but uh, I'm there <laughs> yeah. I'm technically there but I I use Facebook and Instagram the most okay and uh, your your uh, blog and where people can find some of your past writing my past writing definitely you can find stuff on uh, my blog called messy cooking always vegan dot blogspot.in and uh, also a lot of my past work articles and short stories and fiction are on my personal author website which is riyamukherjee.com I'm going to post all of this in the show notes because Ria's name is spelled a little yes, differently. Yes, it is. <laughs> Everyone who's listening definitely go read uh, some of her short stories and the writing style get an idea of it and then I I know that you are going to want to go pick up the body myth so I'm going to post the Amazon link to that also. Yay. <laughs> uh, and you know then you can just uh, order it and uh, it's lovely. It's a it's a lovely story and um one of uh, the authors that i'm a huge fan of and i've read uh, every single one of her books is uh, marianne uh, keys have you heard of her yeah. no what books have she read you will love her really uh, she does fiction uh-huh. and uh, she also goes into deep dark uh, painful emotions she's not scared to go there and she'll cover everything mental health abuse any anything at all that may be difficult to talk about but also she is an optimist so it's not like just darkness right and then you're just left there feeling this dreary thing inside you it leaves you feeling like uh, no matter what you go through you will learn something it's always for your good and something will good will work out and that is that is exactly your writing style too i mean though your writing styles are different what i mean to say is this whole thing of going deep into darkness but also in the end or throughout the process uh, you know learning and seeing the lightness in in the whole thing you should definitely check out her books the only reason i brought it up is because uh, the love i feel for her books that's the kind of love i felt for the body wow. myth <laughs> yeah you have to share all the uh, links with me right after this i will I'll, i'll share her books with you yeah well okay thank you so much ria it was lovely having you here and uh, There is so much, you know. If I keep thinking, there's so much more we can discuss about. I'd love to have you back here again sometime, and we'll talk of more things. For now, thank you so much. And thank you, Shosh. You're um such an optimist and so much enthusiasm in everything that you do. Um, and I'm I'm just so happy and grateful that I could have this time with you. Thank you so much. Thanks. Bye. Bye. If you enjoyed this episode of the Feel Good Factor. Rate, review, and subscribe on your preferred podcast platform, especially Apple Podcasts. If you'd like to be notified about the upcoming episodes of the Feel Good Factor, subscribe to my mailing list on my website 
veganosaurus.com v e g a n o s a u r u s.com thank you so much for listening to this episode of the feel good factor i'm susmita veganosaurus and i'm looking forward to talking to you again very soon bye